<clears throat> okay. um, in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, and God, Amen. Um, thank you guys for having me. I'm glad to be here, and especially this topic um, has hit home, um, and I feel like a lot of us obviously have our own crosses to bear, um, and we'll discuss that and really how that's an actual, obviously, reflection of, of the cross that Christ was on, um, and really kind of to just remove the stigma of uh, the cross being something you know, shameful or um, something we don't want as opposed to something that we should uh, endure um, joyously. So we'll just discuss a few things on that. Um, the premise, just so to have an even playing ground, yes, the cross is something done for us and is all, it is also something done by us. The cross is something that is done for us and it is also something done by us. Now, what does that mean? Simply, Christ was crucified on the cross, but we don't leave it just there. By, by dying with him and being raised with him, we have to partake in that suffering. And kind of as we go through today, we'll discuss how <clears throat> it's not really a morbid thing, but it's something that's part of life and that if we really learn to accept it properly, that we can really find the joy in it. <clears throat> we all know the verse that says um, that I was crucified with Christ. Um, and it's not Christ who lives in me, but uh, it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. If we really want to partake in the life of Christ, we can't pick and choose. We can't just say, I want to live in the resurrection part, without partaking of the suffering part. There's no resurrection without a crucifixion. You can't be raised unless you were dead. So we can't live in that joy, and that's kind of what we're going through during Lent now. Um, and obviously that we see more beautifully during Holy Week is that as we go through the life of Christ and the events that happen through Holy Week, we are not just commemorating it, but we are like bringing them back into life into the present, um, and the word for that is like anamnesis, bringing back to present what has been in the past. So as we were living through and walking through that, that week with him, we are like right at the finish line, and we are, that's why it's kind of called Good Friday, because it's, it's ironic, um, <clears throat> and Father Thomas Hopko uh, refers, you know, he said some of his students referred to it as the bad news of the good news. Yes, the good news is that Christ was crucified, but that's also the bad news for us, not in, the, not in the sense that it's bad news, but that we, it may seem like bad news that we have to endure it, but that is really the good news. <clears throat> so if we want to join with Christ and partake of that resurrection, and if the resurrection was the central act of his life, then it has to be the central act of our life. We cannot be removed from that part of his life and in enduring that i'm not saying to go look out for ways to for crosses in our life to look out for hardships to to seek them no on the contrary we we are meant to live a, a good life but when it does come and it's inevitable to come that we bear it um joyfully and that we know that we are participating in something that christ did so the more we identify with Christ, the more we're able to participate in something that he did, the more joyous it should be for us. Um, this passage in, in Matthew chapter 20, it's when the mother of Zebedee's sons went to Christ and said, um, I'll just read it. It says, And the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him, Christ, with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one at your right hand and the other on your left, in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am to be baptized with? They said to him, We are able. So he said to them, You will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. 
But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it is for those whom it is prepared by my Father. So we can see that they're kind of talking on different levels, similarly to like the Samaritan woman, um, where Christ is kind of speaking on this level, and she's thinking, you know, on an earthly level. And I love this lady because I feel like she's like Egyptian, where, you know, the Egyptian mom wanting to like bring her sons to like the priest or the bishop, like, no, no, let him go on the altar this week. Let him do the, let him hold the candle. Like a mom really caring for her kids. Um, but Christ was letting her know that she's asking something that she cannot bear or that the, the kids cannot bear. And this little different paradigm of trying to understand where we're asking or what we're asking, yes, we can ask to be at the right hand of God, but what does that mean? The road to there is the cross. That's why he answered and said, you don't know what you're asked. Are you able to drink of this cup? Sometimes we can say, yes, we're able. We want to partake in that joy. We want to rise with you. We want to do these things. Okay, but are you able? Are you really able to do it? And we'll touch a little bit later on that. Father Matthew the Poor, obviously from the book that we're referencing, um, says that the cross will cleanse us from earthly hope. So looking at the cross, again, in general, when we say cross, two things. Christ's crucifixion and our the cross that we have in our life. Whether it be um, some type of hardship at work, in our family, um, emotionally, spiritually, physically, a physical ailment, whatever it is that we try to look at it and really understand where it's coming from and what purpose it's going to serve in our life. What, a, what the cross reveals here and in, in what he's saying is how it can cleanse us from earthly hope. Her earthly hope was, yeah, I just want them to sit there. I want them to be well. I want them to do good. Really identifying the cross kind of filters out anything that's, that will, that's not realistic. That earthly hope Yes, it can be temporary, but we want to really endure and, and live in the resurrection to really find that firm heavenly hope that he discusses. So what does the cross <clears throat> reveal? The truth of the cross is really revealed in the resurrection. And let's be real. If we are in the middle of a cross or a trial, it sucks. It's hard. It's very difficult to go through. Everybody has their own cross. You know, sometimes we wish, oh, I wish I had his cross versus mine. Um, but it's like the grass is greener on the other side kind of thing. Everybody, um, and saying, uh, uh, it says in Hebrews that, or no, not Hebrews, in First Corinthians, that Christ will not give us something more than we're able to bear. And if so, we'll make a way for escape for us. And really there we can find that if, we fo if we're focusing on the cross itself, it's going to be hard. It's going to be very difficult. But the beauty of Good Friday and calling it good is that we know the end. We know the resurrection. We know it's there. But if we're living in this you know, kind of area where and somebody was just telling me this earlier, that the devil tries to harp on our our own made weaknesses. So if I'm in the middle of a cross and I'm saying, or like a trial in my life, and I'm saying, you know what, I'm not like I'm not good enough to go to church today. Or I'm not worthy to do this. The devil will harp on that and really add on to that. He won't throw something out of ref left field and say, you know, um, you're not making enough money, like something random. No, if we're saying, I, if I don't feel good enough, if I don't feel that I'm worthy enough to go to church or take communion, the devil's going to harp on that and say, yes, you're not worthy enough. Yes, you're not good enough. And that's really where we kind of have to expand <clears throat> that view. Um, but yes, the truth is we won't see the value in it, unfortunately, until we're out of it. So when we're in the middle of it, it is difficult. But really seeing the value of it, once we're through it, that's what we have to focus on. Sometimes we think that we may know good, or we may know that what, um, what's good for us. And we sometimes may know what's good for us, but we have to understand that God knows better. We can have all these discussions of, you know, I really want this job, or 
this spouse or this car or this house or whatever it may be. And we think it could be good for us. But overall, we, we're, not, we're, we're focused on just this minute timeline where Christ, if we focus on the resurrection and, and kind of the whole picture, we will see where God is coming from. Hail to you, O cross. We, have, we celebrate in, in the Coptic Church, we celebrate the Feast of the Cross twice a year. Um, once during Lent and once in, in September in the month of Tut. And it's kind of set usually in, in, in the Eastern Orthodox Church. They have a Sunday for it in Lent, right in the middle of Lent. Um, so it kind of falls similarly to us. But if you think about it as in Lent as like a race, okay? If you, um, I've never ran a race before, but or like a marathon, but I've attended some, you know, as a spectator. And if you're far enough from the beginning, but too far from the end, you're in this, like, middle area of, like, losing hope. And that's why a lot of the times they have, like, mile markers or, like, banners of encouragement. Um, you know, you're almost there, three-quarters of the way there. And that's kind of what the cross is for us during Lent. We, we're, we're kind of far from the beginning, and we're a little... We can't see the end yet, like Holy Week's not here yet, and there's still a couple more weeks left, and it's, we're just, we've been fasting and doing all these things, and we, we're in the middle. We can't see the beginning or the end, and there the cross is in the middle of Lent to, to realign our focus as the finish line um, to kind of get us uh, back into perspective. Father Thomas Hopko says, Hail to you, O cross. And the beautiful part of saying hail to you, O cross, it sounds, again, weird. You know, if, if somebody not in our faith were to look and say, why are you saying hail to you, O cross? The cross, again, before Christ was on it, it was something, it was shameful. It was frowned upon. It, you know, it was for murderers and, and all these other kinds of people. But being able to focus on what is given to us in a, in a hardship, in a trial, people can take anything away from you. They, you, you're, you know, people, the devil, they can strip you of your belongings, of your riches, of your family, of loved ones. All these things can go away and they can take from you, just like Job. The, the devil wanted to take all these things away from him. But Father Thomas Stopko here says, they can take away everything, but they can't take away our suffering. As if this is something that is joyous for us. They think, or, you know, they think the more they take away from us, the more we're going to suffer. But as long as we leave some area for suffering, then there's still an option for us, a way, a means for us to glorify God. Yes, they can close our churches. They can, you know, during COVID, they wanted to close all the churches. And then in, even in other countries, take away Bibles. You can't pray. You can't do all these things. Remove that, all that stuff. Fine. Remove all that from us. But as long as they can't take away our suffering, there's still a means for us to glorify God. And that's why we can say, Hail to you, O cross. To really exemplify it as something beautiful, as something joyous. And again, not, what I, not as something to search out for, to search and make our own hardships. No, life is already hard as it is. We're going to have our own hardships. But when it really comes to be um, joyful in it, it is through our suffering that we will be healed. What do I mean by this? When any time we kind of look for a, a way out, um, we find ourselves kind of missing the point and to, to not really be present in what God is doing for us. Father Matthew says in the book, he says, Hail to the life-giving cross which if I enter into eternal sleep will not be to me a grave, but wings by which I will soar. The cross is not something that's going to kill me. But no, if I endure my cross and I enter into eternal sleep and I pass away, that cross will be to me wings by which I can soar. And that's so beautiful. It's so beautiful for us to see how enduring that cross and participating in the sufferings of Christ will lead to soaring in resurrection. 
<clears throat> this was the most shocking thing for me to read uh, in this book, and, and it really, you know, shook me. When we see that, you know, especially during Holy Week, that, and we reference Christ as uh, a lamb brought to the slaughter, Father Matthew says, May God allow you to participate in that wondrous picture of a lamb led to slaughter, with the knife placed at its throat while it is calm and silent. It is silent because it is the owner who is the one slaughtering it. It trusts him because he was the one who fed it. This blew my mind. Yes, we know the picture of a lamb, and sometimes it's quiet when the shearer comes to kill it or, or cut its cloth and then cut its neck off. But what he's saying here is the reason that the lamb is calm and silent is because it trusts the one who is slaughtering it. It is the owner who is slaughtering it. That's why Christ as referred to as a lamb, when he was ridiculed and spit on and, and, and beaten, he didn't say a word. He was led to the slaughter as a lamb, silent, because he trusted that this was the plan that was set out, um, like St. Athanasius says on the Incarnation, that this was the plan, that he was meant, he was born to die, to save us. And this plan from God, it's not that God orchestrated this and led him to, but allowed it. And there's a, um, you know, we have kind of this thing that all good comes from God and all bad may come from the devil. But the whole world is in God's hands. God is in control of everything. He's either fully in control or he's not in control at all. We can't pick and choose. We know that God is fully in control. So when things happen, it's allowed by him to, for a purpose. And it is our job in that suffering to find that purpose. And there's beauty in this type of suffering. Um, and again, not in like a masochist kind of way where we want to like hurt ourselves, but to find the joy in it. The hardest thing here for me was if we are a lamb led to slaughter, okay? It's hard in a trial to be silent and, and calm and silent here. But the only way he's able to stay silent is because he fully trusts the owner. He fully trusts the one slaughtering it. Or the one, he fully trusts that God is in control of everything. The only way I'd be able to endure a hardship joyfully and calm and silently is to trust, not that God put me there, but that may he may allow it and may put an option for uh, an opportunity for me to grow. And the only reason I will not be calm or silent during this trial is if I don't trust the one who is slaughtering me, the one who is doing it. He says also, Father Matthew, right around this passage, he says, he's referencing to when Christ was in front of Pilate. And Pilate said, you have no power, uh, Christ said, you have no power at all against me unless it has been given to you from above. So, Yes, he was led after that to be crucified, meaning God allowed it. God allowed it to happen. And he said, you know, one of the hardest things is that the knife descends from above. The knife descends from above. It's hard. It's, it's, it may not be the picture of God that we think. But understanding that everything is in God's hands and that he's allowing it, shows us that the more we trust in him, the more we're able to accept and endure the suffering. Now, the hard part about this is society will say the complete opposite of this. And we are so, like, we're torn. We are, we're, I don't want to say torn. We're pulled between two different ideologies at work, at school, at, and everything else, and then at church. One, one area is telling us to endure, to, you know, bear with uh, joy, bear with suffering and, and, and tribulation. And the other side is the world and the Amazon world is the opposite. Everything is 
for ease and comfort and easy access and to remove pain and to remove any hardships, you know, like, again, and anything from delivering, like, a, a product, you know, it, it took too long before. Now it's like one day, same day, two hours, this drone dropping it in like five minutes. The world is telling us something completely opposite. But for us to really be with Christ as a lamb led to slaughter like he was, let us learn that we should be calm and silent because we trust him. We trust that he will make an opportunity for us um, to grow closer to him, and he will leave that there, but that we have to trust that the knife descends from above. Not that he is causing it, but that he is in control of everything. There's a big difference there, and, and, and try, to, try to remember that. It's not that God is causing suffering, but that he is in control of everything. Okay? When Christ talks about the Eucharist with his disciples, he says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. The disciples after this say to him, this is a hard saying, who can do it? In, in this world, in our, in our Christian aspect of it, it's absolutely hard. And things and, and hardships are difficult but we are not meant to do it alone. In this day and age, uh, Father Thomas Hopko was talking about this. He said, if this happened today in America, where the disciples said, this is a hard thing, who can do it? Today's America's Jesus would say, you can do it on your own. If you work hard and, and you really believe in yourself, you can do it. No, that's not what we think. We know that everything is in God's hands. We offer it up to God. We have a spiritual guide. We have our Father of Confession. We have means by getting through issues and getting through hardships um, and kind of accepting it. Again, another thing with today is that, like we were saying before, life should be void of troubles. Everything around us is trying to make everything more comfortable whether it be food, weight loss, driving, virtual, everything is trying to get us to be more comfortable. Um, and, the, and the book says here that people are making themselves miserable by trying to bypass their cross. And it is only when we take it up that that misery goes away. Okay? People... Are, trying, are making themselves miserable by trying to bypass their cross. Whatever hardship is God has put in our life, people are trying to work so hard to avoid it, so hard to avoid it, th that they're missing the whole beauty of it. And he says that it is only when we take it up that that misery goes away. It is only when we take up that cross that that misery is going away. Our culture is pushing us away from the cross, away from any of that. Don't fall into it. Don't accept it. Don't try to fall into the, let me make everything easy, but really, truly accept what God is giving us. And it is really, it really is a blessing. Um, you know, one of the, uh, Father Bishoy Kemal, an earlier Coptic priest who passed away uh, 20 years-ish ago, I don't know. Okay, 80, 1980. Um, wow, 40-something years ago? Okay. So he had cancer towards the end of his life, and he said that it was, um, he called it like the disease of the saints because it kind of gave him time to, he was a saint anyway <laughs> throughout his life, but to look basically to give anybody hope that falls into any kind of trouble, that if there's some kind of, you know, the joy out of having that, and it may be hard to hear if, if we have people in our family that has it or know somebody that passed through it, but the joy in that or, or the joy that he saw in that was, okay, God has given me an opportunity to know that I don't have much time left on this earth, and I need to get right with him. I need to take joy in this suffering. And it's not to say don't go through 
you know, chemo or all these things. No, it's like we said, it's not to avoid it, but to endure it joyfully. So what is our response to a cross that has, has been put in our life or a, a trial that's been put in us? Thomas Hopko, Father Thomas Hopko says, it is okay to ask why God, but it is only okay to ask that if we're hanging on the cross. Christ on the cross said, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, why have you forsaken me? It is okay to ask why only for hanging on the cross, meaning if we are enduring it, if we are doing our part, then it is then we can ask why, not if we're trying to avoid it and do all these things, um, because that's where God asked. It is in the cross, and we have to realize this, that salvation was completed, right? Christ said it is finished. It is completed. Um, and we think, you know, in, in a worldly view, that we would be saved or healed and, and God would come on a glorious, you know, cloud and like a king, how they thought he would come and not in a manger, on like Mount Tabor. And, and Father Thomas Hopko says uh, that salvation was completed in Golgotha, not on Tabor. Yes, on, on Mount Tabor, we were, uh, Christ was transfigured and that glory was there. But the salvation was completed through the cross. And that's where we kind of want to bypass Golgotha and go straight to Tabor and partake of the beauty of being transfigured, our face shining. But we cannot do that without going and, and finding the completion of it in Golgotha. Mother Teresa, um, obviously she, everybody knows her, and there was this report, reporter kind of interviewing her about what was going on and how she um, has worked so many years to help people. And she was like, you know, you've been with all these people that have leprosy and or this and or that. And she's like, yeah. And the reporter was trying to like rile her up. And she said, okay, but don't you feel bad that you never suffered yourself? And then she took a step back and said, it's because I'm not worthy to suffer. God has not given me the gift of suffering. So if he hasn't given me that gift, the least I should do is be with those who have. And that's kind of how she viewed it. It is crazy to really understand, to see like, you know, some people may say if, 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 if they lived a peaceful life, like, thank God, God has given me the gift of a peaceful life and no suffering. No, she's saying, I was not worthy to receive the gift of suffering. So if I'm not worthy to receive it, I should at least be with those who do. Again, earlier with, with, with uh, what we were saying, how as long as we can suffer, they can't take away our opportunity to glorify God. The devil cannot take away our opportunity to glorify God as long as there is an opportunity for suffering. Um, it says, let us have hope that they can rob us of everything, but they cannot rob us from our death. You know, all the saint stories that we hear in the Synexarium, how if they were going through and trying to convert them or take away or torture them and do this and do that and do this and do that. And at the end, we can't, we can't get them to convert. We can't get them to worship us. We can't get them to do whatever. Let's just kill them. So they can rob us of everything, but that death and entering, that, that suffering, to the next step, which is getting to, to be with God and, and live in the, the joy of the suffering, which is the resurrection, they cannot take away from us. And again, let's be real. It's not pleasurable, obviously. It's very difficult. And it's easy, you know, for me to say here, like, guys, endure your cross, and, and I don't know what each person is going through. Um, but at the same time, we have to take a step back and really see that God took flesh to remove that eternal suffering from us took flesh in our flesh and and went through suffering with that flesh and died and rose so that we can rise with him. That's why in baptism, 
it's kind of like a death and resurrection. And it's referred to as, um, or even, you know, like the blind man. The story of the blind man is referred to like a baptism because there is death and there's new sight, there's new vision. So looking at the cross, we should glorify it and we should take glory in it. We have it around our necks, we have it on our wrists, and in every church it's at the highest place. It's in, you know, as soon as you walk in, you see like a little candle thing to pray in, there's a cross on top of it. You go inside the church on the iconostasis, there's a cross on top of it. You go outside the church on top of the dome, there's a cross all the way on top of it. To really lift it up, and we know in the Old Testament, that on the bronze uh, serpent, whenever it was lifted up, the people were healed. It is through that cross that we are healed. It is looking and, and enduring in it that we receive healing. So we have to put it at the highest point to always remember that it should always be in front of us. Again, not to seek suffering, but to accept it. There's a big difference. And we say some of these in, in the hymns in, in Holy Week, that that um, it's how God accepted it, and that's how in in receiving our salvation. So it's not it's not morbid, it's not gloomy, right? And um, like the picture of love, you know, if we think a picture of love is like a smiley face or like the Jesus with like the thumbs up or whatever, but the picture of love is a bloody Christ on the cross. That's what love is. So if we have a cross around our necks or wherever it may be, you know, some people like just a plain cross and some don't like the crucifix where Christ is on it. But it's not something we should be ashamed of or it's not something ugly or to be turned away from. It's something that we should raise and lift up like we do in, in everything in, in our church to lift it up. We start everything in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and God, amen. That's how we start. That's how we end. We go through. Everything has to do with the cross. We cannot avoid it. And like we were saying earlier, the more we try to avoid it, to, we're, we make ourselves miserable trying to avoid it, but it is only when we accept it and lift it up that that misery goes away. So lastly, it's up to us. Okay, St. John Chrysostom says there's three reasons for healing or going through a, a temptation or a trial or a cross and coming out of it. The first one is to glorify God, like we said before. The second is to help others repent. So if we go through something that, you know, and in our culture it's hard to kind of be vulnerable, but if we go through something and we see people maybe going through something similar, it is an opportunity to help others through it and help them repent. And the one we don't want to hear the most that St. John Chrysostom says and Father Matthew says in the book, the reason for getting through and healing from a temptation or a cross or getting through and getting the resurrection joy is to go back into another cross. And that one may be hard for us to hear. But... We have to be joyful because with every cross, there is a resurrection. It never ends at the cross. Ever, ever, ever. It never ends at the cross. It always ends with the joy of the resurrection. But we just have to be ready to receive it. Like the paralyzed man, when Christ went up to him, he said, do you want to be made well? And the answer we all want to say is, duh obviously, but do we really? Do we really want to be made well? Do we really want to be lifted out of our, you know, I have fun on Friday, Saturday nights. Do I want to give that up? Do we know what healing really means? Like to be truly healed, that healing process is the cross. So it is right that Christ asks, do you want to be made well? And he asks us, individually. Do you want to be made well? He's never going to force healing upon us, but we have to know, like 
the story he was telling um, Zebedee's children that, are you sure you're able to bear this? And if we're ready to receive it, then we can look at the cross as something joyful, as something, not just the cross, uh, like we said in the beginning. There's two things. The cross is something done for us, and it has to be something done by us. That is how we have to live life. We cannot accept, no, let me say it differently. We cannot live in the joy of the resurrection without bearing our own cross. We're, we're living with Christ. Everything we do, we are raised with him, we are born with him, we die with him, we rise with him. We can't fill in the blank with him unless we do everything. And he came and took flesh to do everything that we, to go through life like us, so that we can go through and live in the resurrection like him. So as we get through the last few weeks of Lent, let's remember the cross and remember our cross and not take it as something as God punishing us, but look at it with the lens of Mother Teresa and saying, God has given me an opportunity to glorify him, to get closer to him, and really exemplify what it means to, to kind of look at it in that way and then take a step back and realize, yes, once I get through this, there's a resurrection at the end. And glory be to God forever. Amen. All right. Thank you so much, Sam. That was an amazing talk. Um, we have a couple questions on Menti, but before going into Menti, I'll kind of open it up to the room if anyone has any questions. Or while I let everyone here think of questions, I'll go through the Menti questions. So one question is, how do we realistically not look at other people's crosses and compare? I think the more the more we look inwardly at our own life, Genuinely, we won't have time to look at, at anybody else's situation. Obviously, we live life with each other. We know what people are going through. But the more we have, like we introspect, the less time we'll actually have to look around and to see and to worry ourselves or, or make ourselves busy with, you know, how come this person is going through this type of thing and they have an easier thing than I do? Because if we're really focused on our healing process, that's the only thing we would be able to focus on. So I think, yes, it is difficult to see, you know, if I have, you know, a little, a very hard trial, you know, whatever it may be, and I see somebody with a little bit easier one, I can be bitter. I can kind of go through life and say, you know what, God, look at his and look at mine. And, but as long as I'm doing that, I'm not looking here. I'm kind of like looking at both. So I'm not really focusing on mine. But if I'm focusing on mine, I won't be able to, really give attention to the others. And while talking about kind of not giving attention to others, um, what about how do you go through life without complaining about your cross or like making a big deal of your cross and just sitting with it and um, introspecting it? Yeah. So again, that's kind of what like some of the stuff we were talking about, how not necessarily um, like really understanding that the cross is not the end. That, that's kind of the most, I feel like I can say, and, and Abuna can, can comment after. The cross is not the end. If, as long as we focus that with every Good Friday, there's a bright Saturday and Resurrection Sunday, then that should help us endure. And obviously, it's easier said than done. I'm not saying that. It's, you know, it's easy for me to say that when, like, I'm maybe at the end of the, the certain cross in my life and I'm, like, getting through it or I just got out of one and things are going well. But it could be really hard for somebody to hear when they're right in the middle of it. But again, it's when you're right in the middle of it to really look up and realize, okay, I've gone through stuff before. I've gotten out of it. I'm still going to go through stuff in life after this, and I will get out of it. But know that, one, you're in good company, okay, besides Christ, obviously. Everybody 
every champion in the Bible went through something difficult. So you're in good company. And you're also in good company if you doubt, if you have questions, if you're angry. King David, all the Psalms, he went through every emotion. He was very happy with God. He was very angry with God. He asked God, why did you forsake me? All these things. So we're in good company. So one that should give us some type of comfort that it's not an abstract thought that you know we may not think of, but more more so to know that with every cross is an, a resurrection. Perfect. Um, if God is always in control, where does free will come in? Yeah, so free will is... If, if, okay, God being in control doesn't necessarily, obviously doesn't take away free will. Free will is the, the basis by which we function, okay? We're not, God is not forcing anything to happen. He's not forcing, um, it's like, a, uh, you know, somebody allowing things to happen or willing them to happen doesn't mean that he is forcing it to happen, like I was saying before. Um, so in understanding that, free will is, is there for us. It's there for us to accept the cross or not. It's there for us to um, partake in that resurrection with him or not. So if, we, if we're taking a step back and saying, okay, God is allowing this specific hardship in my life or taking this you know, situation and making me do it, taking a step back and really seeing okay, do I have the option to accept it or not? If somebody is, um, you know, called to be uh, a priest or whatever it may be, you have the, the option to accept it or not. There's, there's free will. And in that, we know that if there was, and it's, it's like a, an ironic question because it is only by free will that, that, a lot of bad things can happen in the world, you know? So if, if, if you're saying, you know, if the question's asking about how can I go through this or whatever it is by free will, I have the free will to get up and, you know, inflict pain on you. Or if I'm driving in the city and somebody's walking through the crosswalk, I have the free will to go hit them. That can cause suffering, can cause something happen to somebody or whatever it may be. And it is not only in just there, but taking, again, a step back to know that God is not causing it, but allowing things to happen and leaving that free will. And that's where it lies. Because if you take away free will, then there's no w what's left. You know, as, as a parent, you wouldn't want your child to force them to love you. It's, it's, it's following joyfully. And like, like we said here with the lamb, Trusting in the owner, trusting in the one that's causing um, that hardship. Okay, I'll take a slight break from, we have a couple more menti questions, but any questions here in the audience? I think I had a comment to like um, one of the former um, questions just concerning about like the comparison of crosses. And I feel like God also gives people specific crosses. First off, he designed us all differently. And then secondly, um, there there are things that get pulled out of a person from um, whatever cross they bear, whatever hardship they bear, and mm -hmm. it's different, right? Like, it's also a gift, but it's a different gift for each person. Mm -hmm. And I think That's we true. also forget that, right? Like, yeah. what, what gets pulled out of you, you don't, like, there's a million experiences I'm sure we've all had that we haven't seen um, what comes out of it for, for us in terms of our character or in terms of um, the redeeming values and qualities that we would have never known had we not gone through um, that tribulation. Mm -hmm. And and that gift may necessarily, God may have designed it to give us the opportunity to get it, and somebody else may have had that already, or may have not had the, the value in getting that. Yeah, everybody has their own um, value or benefit in, in going through a tribulation. Absolutely. Okay, so next question is, what is the fine line between basking, basking in glorious suffering versus cruel, self-inflicted, depressive suffering? Um, yeah, so I think it goes back to what we were saying of it's not something we look for, but something we endure. 
So if something is given to us, you know, whether it be from an internal type of trial, like, you know, if you had a parent who was drinking or was a drug addict and then had a child, you could be born with certain ailments. That is some internal type of cross to bear. There's an external type where people can do things to you and situations and, and whatever, both of those may be. Um, and some areas kind of got this wrong. There was, you know, like an extreme um, monastic rule uh, in, in other Christian denominations where they wanted to like self-inflict pain, you know, or, or wear like tight belts under their like monastic garbs and like, like inflict pain upon themselves. Um, that's, you know, super extreme. What we're saying here is to not, again, not look for it, but accept it when it comes. And I think that's the biggest difference. I'm not going to go out and try to hurt myself or try to find, you know, a way where I, I'm suffering or put myself in a really bad financial spot and say, okay, like, I, I'm really enjoying this. No. It's to really be able to see how our life is going, what decisions we make, and whatever is offered to us in that gift of suffering, we endure it with joy. And enduring it not in, like, not in the sense of, you know, say it's a physical ailment. Not enduring it with joy in the sense of finding joy in the pain and, and being like, like the joker, you know, <laughs> where like he's like laughing with, with, with pain inflicted on him. No. Finding joy in it, how? By looking past it looking at the resurrection and seeing, like you were saying, what, what, what's going to come out of this for me? How is God refining me? Like we always hear the analogy with gold. Gold with blemishes, as long as it goes through fire, gets purified, all those blemishes go away. Yes, in the middle of the fire, it's hard. It's hot. It hurts. We lose people. But after it, we're refined. And I think that's kind of where we see the joy. Um, you kind of touched on this, but you're stating that we have to go through suffering of crucifixion in order to experience the joy of the resurrection. Can we just be joyful without suffering? Um, you can definitely be joyful without suffering. Um, like the, the question they asked Mother Teresa, you know, you never suffered. So she was, her perspective was, I was never worthy to, part, to have that gift. Some people can go through life with fairly an easy life. Um, but being able to endure or, or what I wanted to, to kind of touch on that, you know, how the question formed, is because we can't pick and choose with the Bible, okay? Um, you guys ever heard of, like, the Jefferson Bible where... Um, Thomas Jefferson like picked and chose verses that he wanted to follow. So he went and like literally cut out verses that he didn't like and then made his own Bible. It sounds weird, but we kind of we kind of do that. We want all the good stuff, you know, like that like saying like cafeteria Christianity where like you go to like an open buffet and the whole Christian life is there, but we only want the good stuff. We want the, uh, I will rise with him, but we don't want the walk an extra mile. We want the, you know, the riches and yes, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold, but we don't want to turn the other cheek. We can't do that. It's, we have to really look at that as, as a big picture and see where, where God is asking us to, you know, God wants our whole heart. We, we, and to do that, we have to partake in his life. That's, that's the goal of life, is unity, is communion with God. And that's where we were first designed to be, in the garden, walking with God and being in communion with him. And that's what we do every time we come to the altar. We partake of his body and blood, um, and we have that life in us. And having that life in us allows us to go through everything he went through so that we can receive everything that he 
gave us through salvation. So I think to go back, yes, can there be joy without it? Yes, but at the same time, we have to realize that with that again, just there's no resurrection without a crucifixion. And everybody will go through something, whether, you know, emotional or physical, whatever it may be, but kind of like the premise we were talking about, the cross is something done for us and done by us. Perfect. Um, one last question. Is it also part of our spiritual uh, growth? Uh, does it entail getting to a point where we uh, develop certain equanimity so that we take the what we call bad circumstances and the good, happy circumstances uh, with more or less the same attitude mm -hmm. without without getting trapped into the situation, knowing that it's temporary. Mm -hmm. And even if it is joyful, you just take it with that attitude. And when the pain comes, you do the same. Mm -hmm. So you're developing that attitude of remaining with God, but the, the external of anything happening, which is uh, happening in this material life, mm -hmm. you develop an attitude of staying always very centered on mm -hmm. God yep. and not attached to what is happening externally, because otherwise you're like a yo-yo, exactly. right? Going yeah. up and down. Yeah, there's actually a story from the Desert Fathers about that um, St. Macarius, uh, some of his disciples were asking him, you know, um, he gave them an exercise because they were kind of on that yo-yo kind of feeling. So he told them, go to the cemetery and curse the graves. So they went and they started cursing at the graves and they came back and he said, what did they do? He said, nothing. So he said, okay, now go back and uh, give them accolades. Tell them how good of a job they were doing. And they went and they, they, they said all these good things and they came back and he said, what did they do in response? He said, nothing. He said, that's how you should be. Kind of like exactly what you're saying. Stable and to really, um, you know, that's kind of being well grounded in faith and not um, going on such emotional highs and not saying that emotion is bad because you know we're, we're allowed to express emotion whether it be joyful and or, or sad or cry or whatever it may be but that it doesn't shake the main thing so absolutely yeah Right. So the last question is, what is something in the chapter that caught you by surprise? Definitely this um, this passage right here that's on the screen. Um, I'll read it again. It says, Father Matthew is saying, May God allow you to participate in that wondrous picture of a lamb led to slaughter, with the knife placed at its throat while it is calm and silent. The reason it's silent is because its owner is the one slaughtering it. And it trusts him because he was the one who fed it. It really like blew my mind, honestly, this part, because you think like what a cruel owner to slaughter it. But in knowing that we may know good, but the owner knows best and not slaughtering it for us, you know, but in the, in the analogy of giving us a trial, as long as we trust in the owner, then we'll be able to be like this. And Father Matthew says right after this, you know, how ironic that we're learning from lambs and sheep. And he said he's been around them where, like, they just tie their legs and they're just sitting there. No crying, no moving. They just... And um, I actually YouTubed some, like, videos of it <laughs> after, and it's true. It's, it's weird. And you'll see it in the, in the 21 Martyrs, right, that, that we just recently... Um, and we were able to see it online, just silent. It's as if they were drugged. And everybody asked, like, you had, they were on some sedative, they, something was weird. But no, it was just this, you know, 
I'm sure it was difficult, obviously in the beginning and getting captured and whatever. But when they had their focus on God at the end and knew that this was the end for them, they really lived this. They were really as a lamb led to slaughter, knowing that the knife is coming from above, not in the sense that God is the one doing it, but allowing it to happen for their purification and for all of us as well. So I think the more we trust in the owner, the more we trust that God is doing it, the more we can become and learn from lambs and, and to really endure whatever trial is given to us with um, calm and silence and not, and not a rebuking sense, but really enjoy knowing that it's coming from above. Isn't that the trust and faith that Abraham manifested mm -hmm. with Isaac when he was ready to yeah. go and sacrifice him? Exactly. Until that's an why angel came. Yep. And that's him. why on on Holy Thursday um, in in the church we during the liturgy the fraction that's read is the story of Abraham and it's comparing Isaac to Christ, saying that they were both silent when they were brought to slaughter. So yeah, absolutely. All right, I think that's it for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. We can quickly just switch the screen over to the mic. Sure. Give you guys a round of applause for <laughs> All right, so um, liturgies for the rest of Lent coming up, we have this Sunday, it's the um, week of the paraly paralyzed man. Then on Tuesday, we have another evening liturgy starting at 4 p.m. Sunday after that is man born blind. And then we have the last Friday of Lent. So no um, Tuesday, no Tuesday um, liturgy that week, just Friday. And that's on the 26th at 10 a.m. Um, Monday, we will have Again, on Feast and Fast, it's going to be the Nativity of Our Lord by Phil Aziz. And again, here's just the overview of all the weeks. We are getting to the finish line. Um, we only have three more Lenten lecture series left, so get excited for that. We are having a play again this year. So if you were here last year, you saw that we had the Way of the Cross play. It's on the last Friday of Lent. Um, it was a wonderful performance, and we're um, doing it again this year. We're looking for volunteers. If anyone wants to act, to do voiceovers, to help design the set, the stage, the costumes, we need all the help we can get. So please call Fedi, his number's on the screen, or um, come to the meeting on Wednesday. There is a retreat coming out that's all across northern U.S. called the We Are One. And it has Emba Angelos and Emba Thomas. And it's going to be in Dallas in September. They have limited spots per, um, per diocese. So the Southern United States Diocese is full. All the rest of them are filling up. There's only 60 spots per diocese. So if you're interested, I would recommend you signing up um, ASAP. Again, as always, if you are a student or um, a grad student, undergrad student, or resident, um, please join the campus ministry. That will give you a lot of resources to other students in the area, as well as campus um, events that we have. I believe, Abuna, do we have, um, we have Pascha going on in the... So, Columbia and Monday of Pascha and Monday, Tuesday for NYU, or sorry, Tuesday, Wednesday, NYU. Um, they're going to send out the schedule. So if you're interested in events like that, please join at campus.smsm.nyc so you can get more information. As always, if you would like more information to join, um, follow us on any social media, smsmnyc. Join our mailing list at smsmnyc.com. Um, and you can um, go to links.smsm.nyc. And as always, if you would like to donate to the church, there are many easy ways to do so. You can go through Easy Tithe, and you can Zell, and you can Venmo. With that, um, Buna will close us off. Please stand for prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Through the intercession of St. Mary, St. Mark, and all the wonderful saints, 
O Lord, make us worthy to pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for every man. The love of God the Father, the grace of his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the fellowship and the gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You may go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you all.